The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of this station, JVC Broadcasting Management, or its sponsors. And now, it's time for Radio Jobline with your host, Scott Possessor, right here on 103.9 LI News Radio. Welcome, everybody. It must be Saturday afternoon from 2 to 3 p.m., or it might be Wednesday night from 9 to 10 p.m. We're on twice a week to talk about your career, look at the talent pools, look at the job market, look at the economy, um, look at whether or not people are ever going to go back to the office. We've talked about a lot of different issues on this radio program over the um, seven or eight years, I believe, that I've been doing this on LI News Radio. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to do it. And thank you to John Caracciolo, who I always thank when, when I can. And uh, But today we're joined by an old friend and a sales genius, Jeff Goldberg, the sales problem solver. Folks, if you ever wondered about how to choose a salesperson, how to build a sales team, how to maybe interview salespeople, find out if they're any good. Jeff Goldberg is your man. You're going to want to def- pay close attention to the show. Uh, so uh, he's the head coach and lead sales trainer, Jeff Goldberg and Associates, well, where they're dedicated to helping individuals and organizations attain measurable uh, and sustainable sales increases. Jeff is an award-winning sales professional with almost five decades of sales, sales management training and coaching experience. He's had the opportunity to teach, coach, mentor, and speak internationally in front of tens of thousands of sales professionals, ranging from financially successful veterans to the most junior new hires in a diverse array of industries. He delivers powerful, high-energy programs and speeches that draw on his years of experience in the theater and as a stand-up comedian, which we're going to talk about in just a second. Um... So he's relentlessly energetic, results-driven, and injects humor, passion, and a strong dose of reality into all of his programs. He has delivered training for clients such as State Farm, Aramark, Siemens, Newsday, Cisco, Citibank, Cablevision, and others representing nearly every commercial and industry category. So many companies are trying to hire good salespeople, especially now that things are a little bit tougher. The economy has not been collaborating and cooperating lately. So uh, even more reason you got to have great salespeople. Uh, why is it so difficult? So so we're, we're going to talk to Jeff. Jeff, before we start, tell me a little bit about the stand-up stuff. I, I was very excited to hear this. <laughs> well, first, thanks for having me, Scott. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here with you. Um, yeah, uh, when I do full day programs in front of live audiences at companies like the ones you mentioned, as well as companies nobody's ever heard of until they reached out to me, mm-hmm. um, as fascinating as I think I am, I understand it can be a little boring or monotonous to listen to me drone on and on for seven or eight hours. And that's how long a full day program goes. So mm-hmm. I've always used humor to keep people awake and engaged and involved. And a couple of years ago, I was talking to my coach. She's not a sales coach. She's a, she helps you be the best person you can be. And mm-hmm. we were talking about self-sabotage and how every now and then I'll say something inappropriate in front of a corporate audience. And her question was, why do you do that? Mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, it's always been, when, when the funny's in my head, it's just gotta come out. And sometimes as I'm saying it, I know, oof, I shouldn't be saying this in front of this audience. And mm-hmm. every now and then I've gotten the beckoning finger from human resources saying, mm-hmm. hey, hey, Jeff, did you say X, Y, Z in front of the team today? Yeah. And it's always, yeah, I know it'll never happen again. I know I shouldn't have said it. Don't worry. Never again. Right. And my coach said, um, why don't you find an outlet for that? And uh, I said, uh, like what? She goes, go do stand up comedy. Mm-hmm. I'm like, this was two years ago. I'm like, Liz, I'm 66 years old. Mm-hmm. I'm not changing careers now. Right. And she laughed at me and said, Jeff, they do it at night. Mm-hmm. Go do what you do during the day and be appropriate and then say whatever you want at night. Mm-hmm. And I took a class at Governor's right here on Long Island, which is the club you want to play at if you're a comedian. Right. And six weeks later, I was in front of 250 people and getting laughs, and I haven't stopped yet. Now, I think I know the guys that teach that class. I think they were actually on Radio Jobling once. What were the names of the two, two guys that run it? Uh, that's another class, and I have taken that one. The guy who ran this one, is, his name is John Truson, but you're talking about Rich Walker and Peter Bales. There you go. Yes, they're both friends of mine. They yep. both, uh, I, I produce a show once a month. They both headline for me. Right. They're terrific, and their class is at, uh, it, it's owned by governors. That's called the Brokerage, and it's called Stand Up University. Right. Really, they understand the business of comedy, Right. how to write Writing is the toughest part. Mm-hmm. The performing of comedy, there is an art to that, but mm-hmm. it's the writing that's tough, and they really work on it. You, you, you could never have any stage experience, no comedy experience, and I think their class is seven weeks. Seven weeks, they will help you produce a seven-minute set, and mm-hmm. you'll get up in front of a live audience and perform it. It's, it's 
terrifying and exciting. I, I often say that, you know, jumping out of an airplane from 12,500 feet is the second scariest thing I've ever done. Mm-hmm. Stand up being the first. But these guys make make it easy for you. That's fabulous. Yes. Really, really great story. It's and, too much fun. And so so when you go to these places, so you're getting you're getting big laughs. You get do you, now. Here's the thing. Are you telling stories or are you telling jokes? Well, yeah, uh, I'm not a one liner guy. I am a story guy. But the thing is. And this actually was Rich and Peter uh, taught me this, that the pros, they go for six laughs a minute. Mm-hmm. So they're looking for a, a laugh every 10 seconds. Right. I'm not quite at that level yet. Right. Uh, but uh, I saw Jimmy Carr recently, brilliant stand-up comedian. He's a one-liner. Mm-hmm. He was probably getting 10 laughs a minute. It was incredible. It's just mm-hmm. boom, 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 constant. Mine is there's a little story and then there's a punchline. And mm-hmm. of course, the goal and... Rich Walker, who's a friend of mine, consistently uh, reminds me, Jeff, you got to get to the point quicker because I like telling a long story, Mm -hmm. but the audience wants to laugh quickly. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, I I use comedy the same way you do. I I do speeches and webinars and whatever. um, And I've always found comedy to be very useful. I tell pretty much the same story in a lot of my um, my things because there was something very hysterical that happened. Um, And people love self deprecating humor. You know, when 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 you pick on yourself, you pick on someone else's different story, but you pick on yourself, people like it. So uh, I we'll talk more about this. I'm I'm fascinated by it, and it all leads into the um, to how wonderful you are at sales. I mean, people can hear. Your voice, Jeff, and they, the way you communicate, and they know it's a little bit above, you know, what most people do. So you're obviously very good at what you do. You have a great reputation. Um, tell us about your online stuff that you're doing now. Yeah, this is something new. Uh, I've uh, I've been training companies for geez, uh, 19 years now. Uh, companies like the ones you've mentioned, uh, and when COVID hit, obviously that. In- immediately dried up you know you couldn't get in, onto a plane nobody wanted to bring you in they, they didn't want to get people together so i switched over to doing virtual training which i'm not a big fan of mm-hmm. i i'm better with a live audience where i can interact right. and coaching and um i love coaching people because i truly love helping people don't get me wrong i like getting paid for helping people mm-hmm. but I, I love helping others mm-hmm. succeed make money so they can support themselves their mm-hmm. families and their companies and um Many, many times over the years, I've been approached by people who need coaching, but when I tell them, you know, the investment, it's more than they can handle. And the the challenge is that the people who need it the most, you know, are struggling. They can't afford anything. So I've really worked hard for many, many years trying to come up with a way, how can I serve more people at a price range that's more affordable and also make some money. Right. And so I've got a couple of different offerings now. One is online on-demand training programs. So the same exact programs that I teach live in front of companies like you mentioned, Mm -hmm. I broke them down into video modules. I went into a professional studio and I'm very, very proud of the way they came out. Mm -hmm. It's the same exact program broken into little bite-sized chunks. So uh, my conversational selling skills program, which is the sales process from start to finish, I think there's 18 modules. You know, how to establish rapport and setting goals and the right questions to ask and things like that. Mm-hmm. And then there's professional prospecting. I think that's 12 or 16 modules. And it's how do you use LinkedIn to get appointments and mm-hmm. cold calling and all the ways that you can do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those are available to the public. And then I just launched an online group coaching community. So for the people who cannot afford the one-on-one coaching, this is a fantastic opportunity. We get together twice a month on Tuesday nights for 90 minutes. If one person shows up to the meeting, they're getting actually private coaching. Mm-hmm. If 10 people show up, I'm going to try to get to as many people, a hundred, however many people show up, I'll be able to answer questions, give advice. I call myself the sales problem solver because it's tell me what your problems are Mm -hmm. and whatever they are, I give them advice. Mm -hmm. Um, That's incredibly affordable as far as I'm concerned. First of all, I make it easy to get in $27 for the first month. If you can't afford that, then you should go get another job. You shouldn't be in sales. Um, And then it's $2.97 a month after that. But I'm very big on, I'm not trying to commit anybody to anything that they don't want that's not useful. So there's no contract that can stop at any time. Right. Uh, I'm very excited about that because it's a way I can serve more people. Right. Fabulous stuff. Yeah, yeah. Really very innovative. That. And uh, congratulations. Thank you. By the way, the first meeting of the month on a Tuesday night, it's 6 p.m. till 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, it's just me doing the coaching. And the second one, I have a, bring a, a guest coach with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, last month, I had Suzanne Taylor King, who is a coach. Mm-hmm. She talked about marketing messages that get engagement. It was fascinating. And this month, I forgot the exact date. I think it's February 27th. Um, I've got a guy who's a mindset coach, and he's going to be talking about how to work less and make more. And I'm very excited about that. Well, yeah, let's all listen to that one. Uh, all great stuff. All, all great stuff. So uh, the economy 
you know, it hasn't been great. Uh, Going back about 19 or 20 months right now, we've been in a little bit of a malaise. Um, You've had uh, Jerome fighting off, you know, inflation. Um, He's like a knight in shining armor, you know, trying to trying to keep inflation under control. I don't know where we stand right now because we just had our, our economist on the show a couple of weeks ago. And it looks better, but they keep saying, yeah, but there's a recession lurking. You know, like, what? I mean, we just went through like 20 months of, of, of avoiding a recession. And then many people will say, you know, you, many people say, yes, that's correct. We've had the Cinderella landing. And then you speak to other people, go, no, 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 there's a recession coming. So every year is a recession coming. So I think that affects people. That affects companies and what they want to spend and, and also individuals and what they want to spend. So I wish that go, would go away, you know, like just go away. Just enough already with this recession talk. But anyway, we're, we're going to find out if interest rates are going to be going down any minute now. Uh, so so the, the question that I have for you is, are you finding that people are putting more emphasis in having a great sales team because the economy is a little rougher? Uh, actually, I'm finding that I'm busier than I've been in my entire career. Mm -hmm. Uh, I disagree with what you're saying about Mm -hmm. the economy. I think Mm -hmm. it's actually good and improving. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Fed says they're probably going to reduce interest rates a couple times this year. Mm -hmm. And I really think, Scott, that it depends on which radio station you listen to, Mm -hmm. you know, which side of the aisle you're on. If you're listening to, you know, the the people on the right, they're saying gloom and doom. And on the left, they're saying everything's great. Mm -hmm. And I think it's somewhere in between. But uh, I'm not finding companies shrinking anymore. Mm-hmm. Like during COVID, very hard to get people to spend money. And I, I survived it, but mm-hmm. was not thriving. But now I've got people reaching out to me on, on certainly a weekly basis and sometimes a couple of week, uh, times a week looking for help for their sales team, whether it's hiring, training, because they see that the economy is getting better and they want to do the best they can to take advantage of it. And a well-trained sales team helps you do that. All right, well, let's hope that the economy does continue to get better. So, so the, 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 it becomes this question. First of all, you know what I do for a living, executive search. So, so it is a big part of that is sales. And, and a big part of the getting the company to do business with us, it requires a, a good deal of salesmanship. But we've all been through it for 30, 40 years, so we know what to do. We know what to say. Um, but I'm finding that not every, sales, not every sales department receives the training that it should. A lot of times they're going in on, this is just a persuasive guy, so let's hire him, you know. Um, but how do you identify a salesman? How do you identify someone that's like, wow, this guy can really do it and he could sell in the millions, you know. Can you tell, Jeff, when you when you meet someone? Yeah, so much like being married, you don't know how somebody's really going to work out until you hire them and see what's going on. Mm-hmm. But I think there are things you can do, and one of them is interviewing better. Uh, I don't, uh, one of the per services I provide is outsourced sales management, and I'm often brought in to build a team, uh, or I work with an existing team and to add on to that. And um, I've observed clients doing interviews many times, mm-hmm. and I'm constantly shaking my head because when you're interviewing a salesperson, you can't interview them the same way you interview anybody else. Okay, so tell me, tell us why. Well, I don't care where a salesperson sees himself in five years. Mm -hmm. I don't care what tree they identify with or what their spirit animal is. Mm -hmm. I only care about two things. One is, how do you sell? And I ask questions designed to do that. And if you like, I'll I'll tell you about my interview process. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I'm looking for is, I'm looking for the things that I can't train. I can train anybody how to sell. I can't train everybody how to be a superstar. Like, My sister works uh, uh, for a a, a drug counseling uh, agency. She used to be a drug addict, and she got herself clean, thank goodness, and Mm -hmm. she now gives back. I could train her how to sell. She's never going to be a superstar, but she could be okay. Mm -hmm. But if you've got the raw talent, I can make you great at it. But what I can't do is I can't make you want to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I can't make you be motivated. I can't make you be honest. I can't make you be friendly. I can teach you some words to use, but you either are those things or not. So first thing I do is I look for... What's your motivation? Mm-hmm. Do you really need to make a lot of money? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm going to, I, on a first interview, will ask a question. I know it's, you can't ask what people made anymore, but I do ask, what kind of money do you need your first year? Let, let's say you come in and you do well. Mm-hmm. You're, not, you're not killing it, but you're not doing badly. First year, what do you need? Mm-hmm. If somebody says to me in sales, uh, 40 or 50 would do the trick. That's not my person. No, definitely it's not. My, yep. It's not my guy or gal. Mm-hmm. But if they say, well, 80 would be good, but I could really use 90 or 100, or mm-hmm. I got to have 125, otherwise I can't even take this job. Mm-hmm. Now, there's somebody who needs to make money, and mm-hmm. I love to find out why. 
Uh, I love somebody who maybe just got married, wants to raise a family, wants to buy a house. That's somebody who's driven. Uh, I love ex-athletes for that reason. They're not always the sharpest knife in the drawer. And I'm not saying athletes are stupid, but mm-hmm. you know, sometimes they, they just know how to play a game. But mm-hmm. they're competitive. They hate losing and they love winning. They're good with teams. I like that. So mm-hmm. I look for the things that I can't train people on. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing I want to know is how are you going to sell? So the way I interview people is I do an initial 30-minute interview because I want to get rid of people quickly or I want to see I'm interested. And I don't ask them to go over everything on their resume. Uh, you know, For me, if you were interviewing with me, Scott, I don't need to go through every job. Just give me an overall idea. What are your strengths? What do you think you're strong? Why do you like selling? Mm-hmm. And what are you looking for in your next opportunity? Mm-hmm. And I'm listening for... I've already read their resume. I know what their background is. I'm listening for, are they articulate? Can Mm -hmm. they put a few sentences together? And and, and do they sound like they're personable? Do they sound enthusiastic? I can't teach you how to be enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. You are or you aren't. Mm -hmm. And then assuming that goes well, I always end the first interview like this. Scott, I'd like you to take a little time and consider this because I think this is an important decision on your side and mine. I don't take it lightly. So consider this. If you're not interested, just send me a quick email saying, thanks, Jeff. Don't want to move forward. Mm -hmm. No problem. Mm -hmm. If you are, then what I want you to do is I want you to write me two, three, four paragraphs at the most, and I don't care what you write about. Now, I'm going to pull back the curtain for you, Scott. Again, I'm you're you're my interviewee. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pull back the the curtain. I'm looking to see if you can write because you're clearly articulate, but part of business, part of uh, sales today is using email, using LinkedIn, communicating and writing. So I want to see how you write. Assuming you do well, and I'm hoping you will, Mm -hmm. then we're going to do a second interview and I'll reach out to you to set that up. And here's how the second interview is going to go, Scott. We're going to get on a Zoom call. We're not going to say, okay, let's start. From the very moment we get on the call, I'm your prospect and you're going to sell me something. Mm -hmm. There's no timeouts. There's no let's do it over. From the very, from the exact moment we get on, it's a sales call. And sell me something that you've sold before. You don't have to sell me my product. Just tell me what industry am I in? What's my title? What are you going to sell me? And we'll role play it. And we won't stop until you say thank you for your time or something else like that. Mm -hmm. And Scott, that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. I've spoken to a lot of people who do well on an initial interview, but when it comes to the sales interview, they blow it. Well, if you can't sell me on an interview, mm. then how are you going to sell yourself when you're out there trying to sell my product or service? Mm. So that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Somebody who can actually do the job. And there's one more thing I always like to ask. Let's say that you and I agree that this is a good idea and we get together. And on day one, I hand you a cell phone and I say, go get them, kid. How are you going to go out and find people to speak to? Now, we're going to supply you with some leads, but let's say I didn't. Mm-hmm. Tell me what you would do then. And I don't much care what they answer as long as they have some thinking. I I hear a thought process. So if somebody says, well, I was hoping you would tell me what to go after, Mm -hmm. you're not my person. Mm -hmm. But if they say, well, uh, first, I'd like to get a list of our current customers and I'd like to call them and see why they do business with us. Mm-hmm. You know, check in, make sure everything's okay and ask, why do you do business with us? So I can get a sense of our customer base. Then I'm probably going to go on LinkedIn and I'm going to do some searching there. I just want to hear that they can think mm-hmm. strategically because mm-hmm. at my age and level of experience, I'm kind of out of patience. I don't have the time or the patience to deal with babies. uh, And I don't want to micromanage anybody. So I want somebody who needs support and I'll give them all the support they need. And being a sales trainer and coach as a manager, I'm like heavenly because I can do all that for you. But I want to see that you can think. So that's what I'm looking for in a sales person. Driven, some brains, by the way, you only need half a brain to be great in sales. My oldest daughter graduated from the University of Virginia in May Mm -hmm. with a degree in aerospace engineering. Mm -hmm. She's literally a rocket scientist. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to be in sales, but I want to know you have some uh, something up here. Right. Uh, Something I I wonder how you feel about this. Uh, I don't like it when I'm on LinkedIn and I connect with somebody and five minutes later, I get a sales solicitation and I, because I actually, I will take the time to write back and say, this is wrong. This is LinkedIn is not about, I'm not here because I want to be a target. I'm here because I, to network and job hunt and find job hunters and so on. So how do you feel about that? Yeah, I feel the same way you do, Scott. So LinkedIn, you and I are old enough that we were there at the beginning. Mm-hmm. It was designed to take face to face networking online. It was a networking organization, on, not a specific organization, but it's a place to network with others. So when somebody connects with you, when you accept somebody's connection and they immediately DM you, and I get those all day long. Mm-hmm. Hi, Jeff. Let me tell you how I help coaches like you get a million leads with no investment whatsoever and no risk and no work on your part. Mm-hmm. Terrific. If you could really do that, I would be interested. Yeah. But I always equate that to me walking into a bar. 
and walking up to a woman and just saying, hi, I want to come back to my place. Mm -hmm. No conversation, no drinks, no dates, no nothing. Just want to come back to my place. Now, Scott, you and I can see each other and you know me a long time. Mm -hmm. If I look like Brad Pitt, which I clearly don't, mm -hmm. that might work. But mm -hmm. with my punum, it well, I don't I don't go to bars, but I assume that wouldn't work right. unless it was 4 a.m. and she had had enough cocktails. <laughs> it doesn't work. You, you know, just like in face to face sales or any other type of sale, they have to have a relationship first, because in the almost 50 years that I've been selling, many things have changed. But one thing hasn't. And that's people still do business with people they both like and trust. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen immediately. Yeah. So to answer your question, it's exactly the wrong thing to do mm -hmm. now. I get business from, I get about 30% 30, 30 of my business from LinkedIn from people reaching out to me saying, hey, I've seen your posts. I'd like to talk to you about training or coaching or whatever it is they're interested in mm -hmm. because I do what I call content marketing. So do we. Every day, yeah. five days a week, there's at least two posts coming from me and it's information that helps my target audience. In other words, I'm giving away the information that I would charge them for so they can see here's what Jeff does. Okay, Jeff. Quickly, give us a website before we go to the commercial uh, for people to reach out to you. Uh, there's two. If you're interested in the group coaching program, that's Crush Sales Goals, C R U S H S A L E S G O A L S dot com. That gives you more information. And if you want to go for the 27 bucks, and my personal uh, business website is jgsalespro.com. Okay, listen to Radio Jobline with Scott Possessor. If you want to be on the show, write to me, scottp118 at gmail.com, and also connect with me on LinkedIn. We have a break coming up. Stay with us. And now, welcome back to Radio Jobline with your host, Scott Possessor, right here on LI News Radio. everybody listen to radio job line with scott possession today i'm joined by jeff goldberg the sales genius as i call him he doesn't call himself that i just made i just made that up today um jeff uh, segment one was fabulous you told us really how to identify a great salesperson what are the questions to ask you know the the practical application of re how do you get a good salesperson so now let's talk about training them because they're raw talent right now you've just identified that this person could be a great salesperson. You've identified it. So you know you're on the right track. But now you want to make an investment in that person and you want to make sure he he's as good or she's as good as she can be. And, you know, there are various different training programs. People know about Dale Carnegie and Sandler Sales Institute, all nice people. Uh, but you have your own way, I'm sure. So, so let's talk about how do you train a salesperson? Right. Well, the first thing you want to do is uh, you want to identify what what they need. Mm -hmm. Some people have strengths in one area or another or weaknesses in one or another area. Uh, the programs I, that I have that are the most popular are my conversational selling skills program, which is the sales process from start to finish and mm -hmm. professional prospecting. The, the big challenge that I see with every coaching client that comes to me and every company I walk into is their salespeople are simply not seeing enough prospects. So that's usually where I like to start. Mm -hmm. How do you get appointments with decision makers? How do you get qualified, good appointments that might result in business? Because I don't care how good you are at selling. Look, I'm expert level at selling. I've been doing this a long time. I'm really, really good at it. I often say, I'm so good at selling that people pay me to teach them how to sell. But mm. unless I'm speaking to enough prospects, I can't close enough business unless mm. I, I'm going to get lucky and I don't believe it. I believe you make your own luck. Mm -hmm. So uh, you want to identify what are their weaknesses and then train and coach to them. The thing to understand is it's got to be ongoing. Mm -hmm. Train, in the business, we call it training as an event. So when somebody brings me in for a day of training, I always tell them up front, that's going to do one thing and one thing only. It's going to pay my mortgage. Mm -hmm. It's not going to do anything for your team, except they'll be excited because I'm, I'm enthusiastic and I'm funny and all that stuff. But if you want sales to really increase, what you want is training and then reinforcement, which is what I call coaching. Mm -hmm. So it's consistently giving your sales team. I say every week in the weekly sales meeting, 15 minutes of that should be devoted to training. And you can just take one little piece of the sales process or the prospecting process and focus on that. And for any sales managers out there, one of the things I love doing is I take somebody from the sales team and assign them. So if you were on my sales team, I'd say, hey, Scott, at next week's Monday morning meeting, I'd like you to spend 15 minutes talking about how do you handle the I want to think it over objection. Mm -hmm. So now I know two things are going to happen. One is, Scott, you are going to be investing some time to uh, 
study that and come up with a training for the, the team. And two, the rest of the team is going to listen to you differently than they're going to listen to their manager. Mm -hmm. Of course, self-servingly, I love when companies pay an outside expert like me to come in, but it's not always necessary. It also is dependent on who did you hire? Uh, I have clients that only hire highly experienced salespeople because they're going to hit the ground running. They're harder to manage, but they're going to get up to speed much quicker. And of course, they're going to cost you more, but that's a great way to get things going. Mm -hmm. I have another client. All they do is hire people right out of college. And their philosophy is they've got no bad habits. And that's the kind of company that brings me in year after year after year mm -hmm. to train their people. So you're going to do different types of training depending on what level they're at. For me, Everything I do, and I, I don't want anybody to take it the wrong way or make it sound like it's too simple, but it's all foundational. It's the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. I don't teach anything fancy. I don't teach anything hard to implement because to me, the fundamentals are the fundamentals for a reason because that's what works. Okay. So I'm going to hit you with something. When I graduated from college, now we're talking about 5,000 years ago, so, so it's a long time. But when I graduated from college, one of the first jobs I ever had was a an industrial chemical sales job where I was selling uh, weed killer to uh, parks and recreation. I was selling uh, water accelerant to fire people and, and so on and so on and so on. And I was the number one salesperson that they had. And what I learned was something called the drop close. And that's that you open up somebody on, a, on an amount of weed killer so large that you know what the objection is going to be. I don't need that much. Right? So you, there's nothing else they can say. So I'm opening them up on a 55 gallon drum of this weed killer that they don't even know if it works yet. So, um, and once they say it's too big, well, you know what? I'll have the men prepare a 35 gallon drum, use it in your more difficult places. And they go, well, you know, uh, uh, some other, well, can you send me some marketing material? I said, sir, we pass on, you know, the savings because we don't, we don't waste money with marketing material. Let me have the men prepare a 20 gallon pail, use it in the most r rough places you have for weeds, and then we'll talk about reorders. Um, do you have a purchase order handy? So that, that used to be the, it's called a drop close. Yep. So you, are you familiar with this? I or? am. Uh, yeah. My, my mentor taught me that uh, in terms of getting, <coughs> excuse me, people's budgets. Cause often when you ask them for their budget, they don't want to tell you. Mm -hmm. And his, his, his coaching was, uh, Jeff, tell him, ask him, well, what if I came up with a program for a million dollars? Would that be of interest? No, no, we're not going to do a million dollars. Well, how about 500,000? Mm -hmm. No, nowhere near 100,000? Mm -hmm. No, you're still high. 80,000? Oh, you're more in the range. So that dropping down bit by bit after saying something insane mm -hmm. it actually works well. And it works well even with the wife. Okay, so I, uh, I wouldn't know I'm divorced. Well, no, listen. So if I, if I say, uh, honey, why don't we go out for dinner and a movie? Now, really, what I want to do is I want to go out to a movie. Okay, but I say, Let's go out to dinner and a movie. We'll have a date night. She goes, dinner and a movie will be out all night. I said, all right, let's just see the movie. And she'll go, okay. <laughs> so so the drop close to me has always been part of my sales personality. Um, but but I, I'm wondering what you think of it. You know, is it is it useful in today's modern world? Um, I say anything that works, as long as it's legal, moral, and ethical, is fine by me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, when I'm closing, I teach and use one very simple and very straightforward close. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I find fascinating in my business is I often get calls from VPs of sales or presidents or CEOs saying, hey, Jeff, uh, can you come in and spend a day with my people teaching them how to close? That's what everybody, I get asked that constantly. Come in and teach me how to, teach my people how to close. And I always have the same answer. I'd be happy to come and spend a day with your people and I'll be happy to teach them how to close. What are we going to do with the other seven hours and 55 minutes? Mm -hmm. Because closing is simply asking a question, the answer to which is yes or no. Mm -hmm. You want to buy, you don't want to buy. I mean, I teach something a little more elegant than that, but mm -hmm. that's the essence of it. What people really want is, what do I need to do before that to get people to close? Right. And to me, closing is the natural outcome of the sales process done right. right. And you mentioned a couple of companies. Right. My way is not the only way. I, I happen to love Sandler, depending on the franchisee. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we both know the franchisee. We, we definitely both Rob know. Rob Fishman and... Um of uh, his partner, Rich, Rich Isaac. Yeah. In fact, that's where we met. I don't know if you remember, but uh, Rich and I did a program a million years ago. You were the uh, MC, and we just took questions for the from the audience. I remember that now. That, that's yes. where you and I met. Yes, a million years ago. I, I think didn't that was even, probably 17, 18 I years ago. I didn't even know that. Wow. I yes, didn't sir. remember you were the other guy. Yep. Okay, yep. cool. But, and here's the interesting thing. Uh, we both thought, when, when Rich and I met, that... Um, 
we would do something like SNL. You mm-hmm. know, when I, you and I are both old enough to remember when it first started out, right, and Jane right. Curtin and Dan Aykroyd were doing the news, mm-hmm. and Dan Aykroyd would always turn to her and go, and you know, she'd say something and go, "Jane, you ignorant slut," mm-hmm. and. Rich and I thought it would be funny to put an audience together and take questions because he'd give an answer. I'd go, Rich is an idiot. Here's what you should do and mm-hmm. vice versa. But if you remember, everything that Rich answered, I said, well, that's exactly what I would do and vice versa. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing was about half the audience gravitated to me after the program mm-hmm. and about half went to Rich because Rich is the more cerebral, calm guy and I'm the more funny and outgoing. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, we're all really saying the same thing. Right. Sandler and me and Miller, we're all saying pretty much the same thing because mm-hmm. Sales is fundamental. We're just using different words. Mm-hmm. So that's really the, the essence of it. There, there's a lot of different. Me- there's a ten step method and a six. I teach a six step method. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's all. I keep looking for the twelve step method. By the way, which would be mm-hmm. Hi, I'm Jeff, and I'm a salesaholic. And you go Hi, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, th- I thought I recognized you from the meeting, Scott. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, you know, it, it really is. There are some essentials. You know, you do have to make friends with people. Mm-hmm. You've got to get them to like you and trust you. Mm-hmm. The key to selling is not about what most people think. Most people think it's about giving a great presentation and being a great closer. Those are lovely to have, but not it. All right, it's so about asking the right questions. Let's do a sidebar. Let's do sure. a sidebar. So, so you, you mentioned the word closing a lot in this segment. I did it too. Um, define it. What is closing and how do you close? So closing is asking, a, you, you've done everything else and now it's up to the point where it's time to make a decision. Mm-hmm. So you're simply asking a question, the answer to which is, Yes, I'm interested in buying or no, I'm not interested in buying. Okay. Now, people can say other things like I need to think it over a million things, but that's it. Closing is a question. I teach what I call the in my professional opinion close. And this is exactly how it sounds. So let's say we went through the process. You've seen what I have to offer you. And I'm now going to say, Scott, in my professional opinion, that's the plan that makes sense to me. And what I think we should do to move forward. What do you think mm-hmm. now? Sales is mostly psychology, and in that one short sentence, there's a bunch of psychology. First of all, when I say to you, in my professional opinion, what did I just tell you I am? A professional? Exactly right. I'm like your doctor, your lawyer, right. your accountant. I'm somebody you should listen to, so I'm, I'm implying that. In my professional opinion, that's the plan that makes sense to me. I believe that everybody does everything they do because it makes sense to do those things. Like you and I are sitting in a studio right now. Mm-hmm. Neither of us is wearing a suit and tie. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense. Nobody can see us. Right. By the way, I don't wear suits and ties anymore because COVID changed that. Me but neither. it doesn't make sense. Um, when I get home, this is 3.30 in the afternoon. It'll be 4.30 or 5. I'll go home. I'll walk the dog. I'll have dinner. You know why? Mm-hmm. I'll be hungry. It makes sense to eat mm-hmm. when you're hungry. Mm-hmm. So we do everything we do because it makes sense, including buy stuff. And I'm coming right out and saying... This makes sense. Mm -hmm. In my professional opinion, that's the plan that makes sense to me. And what I believe we should do, not you should do, we, we're partners here. Mm -hmm. We should do to move forward, forward motion. Everybody likes forward motion. Mm -hmm. There's four pieces of psychology in one little sentence. Mm -hmm. And then finish it with, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And then you do the most difficult thing for salespeople to do. You know what that is, right? Um, Not certain. Shut up. Stop talking. (laughs) It's our biggest problem. Most salespeople don't know when to shut up. Mm. By the way, I was taught that in comedy, too, Mm -hmm. that silence can often be your best friend. Mm -hmm. Here's a mistake that brand new comedians often make. Mm -hmm. They'll tell a joke. The audience is laughing. They're so nervous about getting through their set or remembering the next line that they start the next line while the audience is still laughing. Well, you know what happens when you do that? Mm -hmm. The audience stops laughing immediately because they don't want to miss the next joke. Mm -hmm. So what you really want to do is you're waiting for the, for the, uh, laughter to just about be totally gone mm-hmm. then you do same thing in sales mm-hmm. shut up mm-hmm. so you ask the question what do you think and you wait and what you're hoping to hear is make sense let's move forward mm-hmm. in which you place your hand over your pen get a contract signed or whatever mm-hmm. you do to close or they say no it doesn't make sense in which case i'm going to say really mm-hmm. i didn't expect you to say that mm-hmm. why not mm-hmm. And most salespeople never ask the why not because they don't want to hear something they can't deal with. Hmm. I'm desperate to know the why not. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the why not usually sounds like this. Well, you see, Jeff, the thing is, Mm -hmm. the thing, you know the thing? Good. Tell me the thing, too, because the thing is what's between you and me doing business. And then the game is, how do I figure out whether the thing is real, a real objection, or smoke? And by smoke, I mean blowing smoke up your Mm -hmm. nose. Mm -hmm. When somebody's just trying to get rid of you, 
the best thing you can do is, I'm really glad we invested this time together. Mm -hmm. Who do you know that I should be speaking with? Ask for referrals because you never know somebody who's not going to do business with you still might have somebody to refer you to. Mm -hmm. And then you want to leave skid marks in their driveway getting out mm -hmm. so that you don't waste any time with somebody who's not going to buy. Mm -hmm. When somebody has a real objection, to me, a real objection means there's something in the way, Jeff. But if you can get rid of that, we might move forward. Mm -hmm. That I want to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I need to know what the objection is and is it real or if it, is, is it smoke? Mm -hmm. If it's a real objection, then there's a methodology for helping people work through that. And I use those words particularly because I don't like the term overcoming objections, right. even though that's what most of us salespeople say. Nobody likes to be overcome. Right. So I help prospects come to the right decision for them. I help them work through their own uh, objections and come to the decision that makes sense for them, which hopefully is to do business with me. All right. Very, very interesting. Well done, too. Thank uh, you. Because it's a hard thing to describe, you know, but, but you did it beautifully. I do this for a living. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so let, let's say now you're back to hiring uh, a sales team, right? And, and you wanna, you wanna, you've already made the investment, given the training to this person that you hired and you like him and know her and you think she's going to be successful and she is. Now you've got to build another person, right? So how do you put it all together? How do you build a team? Yeah, so first is, I don't, if I'm hiring, I like to hire at least two people at the same time, understanding that not everybody's going to work out. And I'd rather train two or three or five people at the same time rather than one because it's a more effective use of my time. Mm -hmm. um, you have to, th there's a common fallacy that it's the manager's job to motivate their sales team. Mm -hmm. Here's my personal belief. Unless you're a mafia hitman, if you've killed people, you can motivate people to do stuff. If they know you've killed others, mm -hmm. you can get people to do stuff. But mm -hmm. in a sales organization, you don't have a lot that you can motivate people with other than I can fire you. Mm -hmm. And while that's a good short term strategy when necessary, using fear as a motivator is a debilitating long term. So you don't want to use that. Right. What you really want to do in order to build a team is, first of all, create a team atmosphere where you are getting together at least once a week for a meeting where everybody's I, I have an agenda that I use for uh, regular sales meetings. And you want to take the time as a manager to figure out what motivates each of your people because it's different. And here, here's something that may sound weird. Nobody comes to work to earn more, to earn money. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes to work to earn more green pieces of paper with pictures of dead presidents on them. What they're coming to work for is what will that money do for them? So the smart manager understands each of the people on their team as individual un, individuals, understands their strengths and their weaknesses and helps them work on both and knows what really drives them. So Bill might want to build an addition on his house. Sue might, might want to join, join a better country club. Mm -hmm. That's how you motivate a sales team, by understanding each person and working on that. And of course, tracking their activity metrics, knowing what, what activity produces X result allows me to coach anybody to greater success. Mm -hmm. So if I'm, I'm making up numbers real quickly, mm -hmm. if you make 50 cold calls a day and you're making $100,000 a year and you say, Jeff, I really want to make $150,000 next year. Oh, great. Make 75 calls a day. Because mm -hmm. I often say salespeople lie, but numbers never do. Now, you mentioned something. It's another buzzword, cold calls. Okay. Uh, with all the voicemail blockage and all the different systems even by google and microsoft to to prevent you from having to actually speak to someone on the phone do people still make these kinds of cold calls in these numbers and does it work do people pick up the phone all day every day so it's a fallacy that cold calling doesn't work mm -hmm. um I say that cold calling is still the most cost effective and time efficient way to fill your calendar with appointments mm -hmm. if you know how to do it well mm -hmm. but I advise every client and with sales teams that I work with, I call it a blended approach to prospecting. Make some cold calls, send some emails, send direct. I, I'm a big fan of direct mail right now because it's way down. I used to get 15 pieces of direct mail every day, banks and insurance companies wanting my business. Mm -hmm. If one or two come in now, it's it's that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So I say that's a great way to stand out. So uh, email, LinkedIn, I, I consider LinkedIn to be the salesperson's best friend, mm -hmm. cold calling. You wanna do a little bit of everything because depends on which report you read but today it's experts agree it takes between 16 and 18 touches just to get somebody to respond to you now you can make 16 cold calls or send 16 emails but i like a blended approach because when you see my name coming at you from and my message coming at you from different modalities at some point you go who is this guy maybe i should return his call mm -hmm. if, even if it's just to get rid of me and say hey stop bothering me at least i got you on the phone mm -hmm. but yeah um 
I am working with a new client for the last month, and all the salespeople do is cold call all day long. Mm. Uh, I had a new lady start just last Monday. On Friday, I spoke to her. She made 60 calls. She spoke to four people. Four people picked up the phone. These are not people who she left a message for and called back. Are we calling cell phones or calling business numbers? Both. Both. Both, yeah. Um, There are various companies that will supply you with that type of uh, option. Uh, Zoom Info is the most famous one. Mm -hmm. It's very, very expensive. It's known as the most accurate. I just brought in one called Lucia, which is similar, but they give you cell phone numbers, direct dials, as opposed to a company number, so you're not dealing with the operator. Mm -hmm. Uh, Emails, and that gives them the ability to use that blended approach. Yeah, we use Zoom Engage, and we've had moderate success with it. I would say it's pretty good. You know, I, I, we're not renewing it, so that should tell you something. But but we did use it with with some good effectiveness. We picked up some clients. Um, but you mentioned cold calling. Now, why not make it a warm call, Jeff? I, I, even if, even is it better to have cold call? Let's say you have fifty people. If I write them all an email. And say something nice, you know, and, and don't don't ask for money. Don't ask for the sale. You know, just say something nice, you know. Um, and then a week later, I call them, you know. Wouldn't that be a warmer call? Would, would, would the call not have a better chance of going through and being successful? I'm asking. I'm not telling. No, I'm asking. I think you're right, Scott. Um, the first thing is. Nobody really knows what's going to work in any given situation. Mm -hmm. You know, I I know a lot of marketing experts. They don't know either. They try things. They test and measure. They see what the result is. And then they either keep with what's working or they adjust. So I'm with you. I believe sending an email first and then following up. I wouldn't wait a week, but a couple of days later. Mm -hmm. And typically you're going to get a voicemail. Mm -hmm. You rarely get through to people, although this lady out of 60 calls did get through to four. Mm -hmm. Not a great ratio, not like it used to be in the old days, but not bad. Mm -hmm. But if it was me, I would send send a message via email, and I'll tell you the type of message I would leave send if you want. And then a couple days later, I would call and leave a voicemail that sounds like this. Hey, Scott, I'm sure you're too busy to return my call. I just wanted to point out, I sent you an email yesterday or two days ago at 12.58 p.m. The subject line is whatever the subject line is. When you have a moment, take a look. And if you're interested, call me back. So now there's two touches. Mm. Excellent. That's very well done, too. Now, Jeff, we're running out of time. We, we The show is so fast. P- please give people one more way to reach out to you if they want to join any of these things that you talked about today. Well, you can certainly always call me at uh, 516 314 Nine zero three seven. That's my direct line. I answer it myself. Mm-hmm. You can email me at jeff at jgsalespro.com. If you're interested in the uh, group coaching, that's crushsalesgoals.com. Uh, you can always find me on LinkedIn too. Fantastic. Jeff, fabulous job. Thank you so much for being with Thanks me. We shouldn't me. wait all these years in between. You've been <laughs> my listening. pleasure anytime. You've been listening to Radio Jobline with Scott Possessor. If you have an idea and would like to be on Jobline, you can write to me, scottp118 at gmail.com. Also, connect with me on LinkedIn because, first of all, everybody else does. And second of all, you'll see all the shows we do here on LI News Radio after they're broadcast, we post them. On, L- on LinkedIn so they'll come right into your news feed if, you, if you're not able to be around for the broadcast uh, have a great week everybody we have another great show coming up next week and I want to once again thank Jeff Goldberg for doing such a fabulous job there's nobody like you Jeff thanks for having me pal alright have a great week everybody happy hunting the views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of this station JVC